this is Hot Chocolate with Paul. I've got my old friend Tony Wexler with me. Uh, Tony and I go way back to high school. Yeah, it's been a few years, huh? Yeah, uh, we go back to our days at WGMC Radio when you were better known in those days as Crazy Tony. That's right, <laughs> with The Rock Spot, which was the show that I had. and That's back uh, in the days when DJs talked like this. That's right, and I, I guess I have to point out that you got such a nice microphone there, and I'm using my laptop microphone, so you're probably going to sound a little better than me in this in this particular episode. <laughs> well, I'm in my what I consider my podcast studio. Actually, it's fun. It's and to do this, and it's also funny that you that we picked today to do the recording. And today is the day that I'm celebrating my 200th podcast episode. It actually comes out today. Well, congratulations. Yeah, 200 episodes. I can't believe I've gotten <laughs> that far. It's like, it almost seems like yesterday when I decided to start this thing up. Yeah. So uh, what was it that motivated you to start it up? Just tired of the negativity in the world, you know, and everyone, we all get sucked into that. Uh, and everywhere was negativity back in 2020. And that was after I started my my coaching business. I had left my career as an investigator uh, for 20 plus 25 years and decided that I was going to start a speaking and coaching business. And I remember sitting there looking at social media going, wow, there's got to be some positive content out there. And that's when I heard that voice that said, that's your job. And I, oh, okay. And I remember back in our old days, Paul, when we were on the radio, I said, well, you know, I always wanted to go into radio. I just couldn't find it to be the right career because, as you know, especially back in those days, the guy on the radio who made the most money was the morning drive guy, the guy that was on the radio doing the traffic reports and all the music at 5 in the morning. And I just couldn't see myself doing that when I was 18. So I, I never went into in that direction uh, to go into um, to go into that field. Anyway, fast forward to 2020, and that voice said, it's time to do a podcast. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I went out. I, I had some of the equipment. I set up a small studio and started podcasting. And it's mostly interviews. And what I like about it is just like this, Paul, we had conversation. I just have conversations with people, with good friends of mine, people that I know. And we talk about really, really fun topics. One of my first episodes has another a uh, friend of ours from the old days, Bert Stein, talking about uh, yes. his experiences, his experiences with uh, with with surviving cancer. And among other things, he, there was a lot of surprises in that episode. That was a fun one. And it's mostly self-development and just positive content that people can listen to and walk away feeling better, which is uh, a lot better than listening to the news these days. Yeah. So where can these podcasts be heard? Uh, the name of the podcast is Strive to Thrive, the Purposely Positive Podcast. I know that's a mouthful, but if you Google Strive to Thrive, the Purposely Positive Podcast, you'll find it on whatever platform you like. Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. It's uh, it's pretty much on all the platforms, but the best way to find it is just Google. And I made it long on purpose because if you just Google Strive to Thrive, you, you'll, there'll be other things you'll find. But if when you add Purposely Positive Podcast, it comes right up. Okay. Um, now, I think I remember reading or hearing somewhere that there was another Tony that gave you some inspiration for some of this. Yes, uh, I became a big f fan of Tony Robbins, and okay. he's been out there in the world for, for many, many years. I remember I have his first book uh, called, um, I think it's called Ultimate Power, but um, it was written like back in the early 80s, and that was when he was much younger, and so was I. But the thing about Tony is he, he's been around for a long time, but he's like six foot seven i mean he's a he's a huge giant man i think he's even would be even taller than you paul which yes i'm six hard, foot, hard. i'm six foot five <laughs> yeah yep so he's six seven and but he he's been around for a long time he charges like a million dollars to speak or to coach now oh. i'm five five i'm five five and my rates aren't that high 
but they call me the other Tony. Okay. Well, uh, at a million dollars, um, I I don't know about you, but I personally would be happy with doing just just one episode like that. <laughs> and absolutely. I just have to like... <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I would too. Uh, but he yeah. you know, he's been around around for a long time, and he's inspired a lot of people. I actually went to a seminar of his back in November 2020, and I did what's called the fire walk, where I actually walked across um, 15 feet of of like fire, hot coals. And oh, wow. uh, not got burned. It was pretty cool. Uh, it's amazing what uh, the mind can do. Wow. Okay, the mind. How about the skin? <laughs> well, the skin. The skin was fine. In fact, it was more painful walking across the parking lot to get to and from the hot coals because in down in Florida, where they had the uh, seminar in West Palm Beach, they actually use like seashells in making part of you know their their mixture for the driveways for like the asphalt so uh it's a little painful walking across so that hurt more than walking across the hot coals if you can believe it wow so um some of these things that you've heard um tony talk about or your own methods have, how much of that have you used in your own life uh i've used most of it right now I, and uh I, you know every time I'm a big learner, as and as you remember from even the old days, I always love to read, um, and I read even more now than I did before. Um, um, so every time I learn something, I try to implement it in my own life to see if it works, and if it seems to work, then it's worth teaching others. Uh, gratitude is one of my favorite things. I have something that I do called the three-by-five card method. Now, some of the younger people may not remember what a three by five card is, but we used to use them all the time for notes, index cards. Uh, for those who, who are watching on a video, I'll kind of hold one up. So this is a three by five card. So what I do at night before I go to bed, and this is something I developed, I kind of combined a whole bunch of different things that I learned. And on the three by five card, on the first side, I think about the top three things that I have to get done the next day kind of a to-do list, but a to-do of the important things. I mean, it's not just get the laundry done or cut the lawn. It's important things, things that will move me further in life and in my business. So I'll write down those three things and I circle the most important. And after that's done, I turn the card over and I write down three things that I'm truly grateful for. You know, things like, well, you know, you and I have this friendship that's been on since high school we've known each other that long and yeah. i'm grateful for that so that may be something i may just put grateful for my friend paul i may put grateful for the comfortable bed that i get to sleep in i'm grateful for uh my my cats uh my children anything so you think of the first three things that come to your mind that you're grateful for and after you write them down you put the card down and you go to bed you sleep you get up the next morning and you don't check your phone because that's what everybody does. Picks up your phone, check your phone in the morning. You don't do that. You look at the card and you say, okay, what are these three things I'm grateful for? And you spend a minute on each reflecting on how grateful you are for those things. Because gratitude is one of those emotions that puts you in a much higher state. You'll feel much better. It's hard to be worried. It's hard to be upset. It's hard to be angry when you're grateful. So spend that time in gratitude, then flip the card over, look at the first thing on the list that you circled and get out there and do it. And you do this for a week and you find that you're getting more things done and you're feeling a lot better. And you're also sleeping better because you download those important things that you have to do onto that paper before you go to bed at night. So that's called the three by five card method. Okay, interesting. Uh, a lot of positive reinforcement. Um, so I know you like to um, conduct Bible studies too. Now, how does that fit into what you're doing, or does it, or is, or is that uh, two separate things? It's sort of two separate things, but I find inspiration from that. I, I this is a group that I put together a long time ago. Uh, I, it was a Facebook group. A bunch of friends just wanted me to uh, to go through. And what I do is I just read uh, a little bit and I post kind of commentary on the particular chapter. So right now I'm in the book of John and I'll go through certain verses. Uh, 
and I don't skip anything and I do it verse by verse, line by line. So that way you're not taking anything out of context. Cause I find uh, that sometimes when you get into like organized religion, things like that, they take a lot of stuff out of context. So I try to keep everything in line and in context. So that's, that's what I do. Um, but as far as being part of the business, I kind of keep those, those things separate because I will work with, with anybody regardless of what their faith is. Uh, I will work with people. Um, it's sometimes it's easier to work with people that have some type of faith because it just helps them to, to see the bigger picture, but it's not necessary. Uh, we have all kinds of flavors in the world and, uh, they're usually all good flavors. Uh, I mean, there's a few bad ones, but I stay away from working with those people. Yeah. Now, without giving any personal information away, um, what would you say are some of the success stories with people you've worked with? My favorite story, well, I have two. Uh, one of my first clients, when I first started out, a young lady who is a gymnastics coach, and she, we met in a, in a coaching group and she lived in, up in Ontario, Canada, and she was just burned out of her job and she loved the work, but just the situation she was in, she had a tough relationship at the time uh, and even her relationship with her family. And we worked together for um, what would be a typical 90 days, 90 day program. And after that, she made a lot of changes in her life, and she currently lives uh, in, um, uh, in I believe, the Virgin Islands, okay. <laughs> and uh, she teaches a gymnastics program there. Uh, she met a, a new guy in her life that she's with, and she's basically living the dream life, and uh, she has told me that it all started by uh, our conversations and some of the things that uh, that I helped her work through. So that was, that's something that really touches me. We're still, we're still in contact and, uh, and she's just a, a wonderful person. So that was one of the first ones, uh, when I first got started. And then, uh, fairly recently in the last year, I worked with a guy who was having difficulty with his business and his, uh, he was working all the time because he was trying to get this business off the ground. And it was just, really affecting his health and his family life. In fact, he and his wife were having arguments all the time and we started to work together. And after the first month, a little after a little over a month, I got a call from his wife of all things. And she wanted to buy me a gift card to my favorite restaurant because she was so excited about some of the changes that he's made and he had made in his personal life and not just his business. And apparently they were now going out on date nights and that he was spending more time at home and with the family as well as, as working and not getting as stressed about it. And it really made a difference. And for me to get that phone call from her of all people really, uh, uh, that really inspired me. So I would probably say those would be probably the two cases and two clients that I work with where, I uh, really stands out that I just felt that that uh, that they took some of the things that I taught them. Uh, but the difference about coaching and consulting, I think a lot of people have in therapy. When you go to when you hire a consultant, the consultant comes in and solves your problem for you. With a coach, the difference is that everyone has really they have the solutions within them, and it's my job as a coach to bring out those solutions. So that's. Uh, on the coaching aspect of my business, especially working with people with burnout, I think that uh, everyone has, everyone pretty much knows what to do. They just need somebody to kind of encourage them along the way. What kind of credentials do you need to be a coach? I mean, you know, talk about counseling. Obviously, they go to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds to me like in both cases, this is something that you would get paid for. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, if I was approaching you and say, what can you do to coach me? Um, you know, what? What kind of credentials do you have that make you somebody that I should trust? Well, I took uh, coaching, uh, several coaching programs, and I have certifications with those. And that's pretty much uh, what you need to be a coach. It's not as uh, it's not like therapy 
we actually have to go just because therapists work on on so many different things, so many different levels. In fact, a lot of times people mix up a therapist or a counselor uh, and, a, and a coach. What they'll uh, and I've talked to people and I've told them, you know, I think right now you need to be in more of a, a counseling situation. You need to go to a professional uh, counselor because they have much deep rooted issues. Uh, whereas uh, and sometimes someone will go to a counselor and they'll be working with them for a while. And the counselor will tell them, well, right now um, you don't need a counselor. You, you need a coach. I have a client right now that went through that situation. They had been in counseling for a while and now they need to start putting their goals together. So um, I would say, you know, that's what really the difference is. And same thing with the uh, certifications and so forth. Do you have any ambitions to be a counselor or take this beyond coaching? No, uh, I'm I'm more of a speaker, trainer, coach. I, I like to coach people. I like to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I've uh, gotten into doing speaking like keynote speaking, keynote addresses. I actually just uh, yesterday, I, I did a, a big presentation uh, on the, um, what was it? Uh, the power of decision, which is one of the talks that I do. And uh, that is something that I just, I love doing. I also train people in uh, sales techniques, negotiations, because I, as I, as an investigator, I was really good at getting confessions. So a lot of the tools that I use to get confessions in like NLP, neuro linguistic programming, I can use in, uh, in telling someone or teaching someone how to sell things like a car or insurance or things like that. So I like teaching that. I recently taught um, a, uh, a friend of mine uh, who's an attorney to help him uh, with some of his negotiations and uh, become a better negotiator. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Paul, but there's a guy out there named Chris Voss, V-O-S-S, -S, and he was a former FBI hostage negotiator, and he wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. Really good book if you get a chance, mostly be because he tells a lot of great FBI FBI stories in the book while he's talking about negotiation. But a lot of things that Chris teaches, when I first read his book, I was going, oh, yeah, this is something I do. Yeah, yeah, we do this. I do this. So it's really interesting that some of the stuff is universal. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we talk about is in sales, there's this thing called a yes ladder. And that is, have you ever had that phone call um, from some telemarketer who says, first thing they say is, would you like to save money on your gas and electric bill? And the obvious answer is yes, of course, because everybody would, right? Uh, and then they get they continue to get you to say yes, because they think that if you keep saying yes, when they finally get to the offer that they're making, like, would you like to buy, uh, would you like to have new vinyl replacement windows because you want to save money on your gas and electric, right? They think you'll say yes to their offer. So they call that the yes ladder. And it's been taught and taught for many years. Well, a guy by the name of, of Jim Camp wrote a book called Starting With No. And he's found that most people like to start with no in their conversations because it protects their autonomy. So one of the things that I'll do, like, for example, when I'm out booking the band, I will, when I try to call the venues where they're looking to book a band, like a club or establishment, the first thing I'll, I'll ask them, is this a bad time to talk? Because if it is a bad time to talk, I don't want to talk to them. So they'll tell me yes. But if they can start with that word, no, the best way to get somebody to return your emails is, especially if you want to work with them in some way, just ask them a straight question. Have you given up on working together? Have you given up on working on this project together? And the immediate answer is no, and it protects their autonomy. It's very interesting uh, psychologically how that works. Yeah, that, that is pretty interesting. <laughs> um, I, I think one thing we're missing these days is a telemaker to calling the, the old slam down the phone. <laughs> yes. If you really want to say no. Exactly. Well, well yeah. now we get it. Now we get it in our social media all the time in, in uh yeah, I get a lot of spam in Messenger, and then somehow all of a sudden I'll start getting these bizarre texts and phone calls. But uh, it's a really, really interesting world that we live in today. Yeah. Well, being that you and I have known each other for such a long time, I I can't let some of our past go unspoken. So um, 
Yeah, we met in high school. I went to Greece Arcadia High School. You went to Greece Athena High School. I wanted to get involved in radio, and it turned out WGMC Radio at that time was located in Athena High School. And that's when you and I first met. And uh, I remember we had our separate radio shows, and we did a few things together. And then I remember one day you were posting about uh, trying to recruit people to form a band. And uh, we've been making music on and off ever since. Yes. So for those uh, watching or listening who don't know Tony, um, he plays several instruments, but you're most well known for playing the bass guitar. Yeah. Um, you've done some songwriting, um, songs that we've recorded together. Um, we've played in a couple of bands together. Uh, one was... Uh, in 1978-79, which was called Silver Quarry, and I remember you came up with the name for that, uh, taking stealing from the Beatles because they were one time called the Silver Beatles and another time called the Quarry Men. So one, our our one gig that we had together was at Spencer Park Junior High School. <laughs> yes, I remember that. I remember that, and it doesn't feel like it was that many years ago. Even the WGMC days um of being on the radio but playing music you know i i did want to mention that if he, anyone listens to my podcast when they listen to the theme music paul you are actually on the theme music because that's it right. was a song instrumental song that we went in the studio i believe you were working on a project at the time and needed some instrumental songs i think yes when you were developing some television that yeah. you were working on and we wanted to get some instrumental songs so I played bass on it, and I think I played um, uh, some keyboards. And yep. my friend John Borelli, who I actually currently play in a band with now called Executive Order Band, uh, he was playing some guitar. And we recorded uh, a whole slew of instrumental songs. And when I was looking for theme music for the podcast, I was going through that because I didn't want to have to try to find music that was copywritten and have to deal with all that. So I said, oh, let me try this. So when you hear the show, when you turn it on and the music starts, that is, uh, I'm on the bass, John's on guitar, and uh, you're playing the drums. Yeah, and the first thing, and that particular piece, the first thing is the drum roll going across the time, the snare and the time times. Yes, yes, so, and then the bass comes in. Yeah. Yeah. So I get to start off your podcast all the time then. <laughs> yes, yes. You start off the podcast, except for the voice. Uh, I'll let you in on another little secret on this too. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have a good friend who lives in the UK. Her name is Allison. She's actually been on the podcast a couple of times. And I was having a conversation with her right around the time that I was getting the podcast ready. And listening to her voice, I, it gave me this idea i used to be a big fan of monty python and monty python's flying circus and for those who might be old enough to remember monty python the old television show at the beginning of every show you heard the words and now for something completely different and then the theme music would start uh -huh. so i said to allison i said allison i said let me throw on record can you do me a favor can you say these words and now for something purposely positive Okay. Because it's the purposely positive. So I had her say this like three or four times. I took the best cut of that and put it at the beginning. So you hear her voice saying, and now for something perfectly. Oh, yeah. And now for something purposely <laughs> positive in this very proper accent. And it's just, it's, it's an interesting way. A lot of people don't even catch it. And then the music starts and then we go on. Uh, and then the funny thing is the first time I interviewed her on, on the show, she went to listen to it and she reached out to me and she says, I didn't know you were going to ambush me with my voice. first." <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is that? There's a, there's a line from the movie, Mary Poppins that, that, that makes me think of right now is something. Uh, it's escaping me. Oh no. It'll, It'll probably come to me after we're done talking. It'll, usually at 3 a.m. That's when those thoughts come. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we continued on uh, with another group that we called the Mods. Um, we, I think we did pretty well with that back in the early 1980s. Yeah, we, uh, we played quite a bit. Uh, yeah. and that was that was um, 
you and I and John still, you know, the, you know, the, the threesome we've been, we've also been together, John, we met John Borelli also at uh, WGMC and we've all been friends. We've all been friends ever since. And it's really interesting because I have a lot of people that I I come across. And when I tell them that, Oh, I have friends that I've known since high school and some friends I even have that I've known since elementary school and I'm still in contact with. And uh, it's a rare thing, but it's, it's really a true blessing really to have, have you guys. I mean, we've, we've lived different lives. We've gone separate ways, but we still always come together and, no matter what happens in life, you know, it's just great to have old friends like that. But the mods, that was another fun band. And I, I had uh, the girl I was dating at the time and I went on to get married <laughs> to, and she was actually the, uh, the singer and uh, Eileen and I taught her how to play bass. So um, she played yeah, I bass. Remember, I remember she played bass on a lot of those songs and even at yes. your wedding. Uh, yes. we, we all did, uh, we all did a couple of songs. Yes. And uh, there's her in her wedding gown playing bass. <laughs> playing bass. And uh, yeah, that was when I wanted to play a little bit more guitar. So I got her to play. But uh, I still I still did play bass quite a bit in the mods as well, uh, yeah. especially on some of the songs that she sang lead vocals on. But, uh, you know, we we later uh, in life, we we split up. And uh, here, the funny thing is, with Executive Order Band now, uh, so John, of course, it started the band and his keyboard player, uh, and had left the band along with his drummer. So they were looking for new people. And he recruited um, Eileen, who's now my ex-wife, uh, the, her boyfriend, to play keyboards. And the singer couldn't make one of the rehearsals. So she kind of stood in, and she hadn't sang in a number of years. And she started just singing to fill in. And they decided to have her come in and join the band so they would have one male singer and one female singer well shortly after that the bass player quit and uh my band that i was playing in at the time uh, called um um well, well, retrospect that's right that i was in re- retrospect i was with my son my son was playing drums in that band which is the coolest thing in the world by the way my son who was born july 7th ringo Starr's birthday of course had to be a drummer so we had him playing with that band and uh when uh when our lead singer decided that she'd rather become an optometrist uh, than become a lead singer become an eye doctor she went off to school and that band broke up and John's bass player had left, and he invited me to play bass with with that band, with Executive Order. So here I am now playing with with three of the members of the mods. Unfortunately, you're the one who's who's not in that particular band. But uh, right. <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting to to play with uh, with your ex wife and and uh, her boyfriend. But you know what? Uh, I'm we're good. We're all friends. Uh, everyone's adults, uh, you know, when you go through something like that in your life, uh, I always believe you shouldn't hold, never, never hold a grudge, uh, you know, forgive, forget, move on and, uh, and just try to live a purposely positive life, which is what I talk about a lot on the podcast. Right. Um, and then of course, let's see, two of them and you and me, we had another band called Intrigued which yes. was together for a long time, um, also played out uh, around the Rochester area. Um, let's see, I think um, I think the place we played at the most was Stewie's. It was known yes. as Stewie's in Spencerport. Yes, Stewie's, so, it's now a uh, clutch on the canal right now. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's still a uh, it's still in this. It looks a lot different when you go inside, though. You'd almost not even recognize it except for the stairs going upstairs but i remember playing uh at stewie's a lot and it was just it was a fun place to play we always got a good crowd in there and and, you know we did a lot of playing as the mods uh or and or as the mods and as in intrigue uh boz dykes restaurant which is sadly oh yeah that's right there in gates that was another place that we really enjoyed and they had an older crowd and those people just loved to dance so we got to play a lot of the uh the fun older songs and just yeah i i I have a lot of good memories from those days yeah and i think um, a lot of people still knows the boz dykes location as the old dog and suds Yes, dog and suds. You know, yeah. it's funny because that corner is almost unrecognizable now. 
It Mod is. Sykes yeah. was replaced with a with a Walgreens. Um, there's an interesting story ab about that, but I don't want to really get into it. But unfortunately, uh, the restaurant kind of got sold underneath Rob Bosdyke, who was running the restaurant at the time, and uh, and they ended up building this um, this uh, you know what pharmacy uh, Walgreens right there. So that's on the corner. Well. Across the street was a place called Valicia's, and it was an Italian restaurant. And the guy who owned it decided to put an addition on because he wanted to have more parties and to make his bar bigger. And he realized that those people that used to love to go to dance at Bosdykes were still looking for a place. So Valicia's became kind of like the new Bosdykes. And the older crowd would go in and dance, and they played like a lot of fifties music and sixties music, and uh, it became very, very popular. Well, recently, the guy who owned um, Valicia's decided it was time to retire. He sold the restaurant, and now that is a Burn Dairy, which is another rest, or which not only is the restaurant not restaurant, but uh, convenience store type place. It's also another. It's a gas station. So you but go to that corner. Apparently they're not booking bands there. <laughs> Apparently not. So yeah, so you go to that corner where there were two really good restaurants at one time, and now there there's no restaurants. So it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I um I actually drove past there quite a bit when um when that building was just about to be torn down. The fire station and the third corner there was actually using it for fire training. They set some fires in there chopped some holes in the roof and did what they had to do just before tearing the building down. So it was kind of, it was kind of interesting to watch all of that. Yeah. So, you know, as far as personal connections go, we can't ignore the fact that two of our daughters have known each other literally since birth. Yes. Um, well, my youngest daughter was born after your daughter was born and you guys came in to visit the day she was born. So that's when they met and they started out as friends. You know, we've got a lot of pictures of, of them when they were younger. They went to each other's birthday parties and today they are still friends. So it's, yeah, it's kind of nice to see that less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was here, uh, uh, your daughter Melissa was here with, with and uh, spent time on uh, 4th of July, uh, I remember. And then I think she's been here um, at least once since then. And yeah, they still talk all the time. So that, that's pretty cool. Uh, two generations of uh, Wexlers and Packishes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, where is executive order playing around these days? Uh, we're doing a lot of campgrounds right now uh, because it's the campground season. But, uh, you know, we did get to play the Wounded Warrior benefit just a few weeks ago. And I'm, I know that uh, actually uh, you and, uh, and your lovely wife, Stacy, were, were at that event. Uh, and that was kind of fun. Uh, just look, just looking at my uh, my calendar here. Um, I know we're doing the Hamlin VFW, uh, which is our next gig on September sixth, uh, and that's open, you know, to the public. Uh, and we're doing Tyson's Upper Deck, which is in Lima, on September fourteenth. Another evening gig over there. Uh, we're actually, I, I believe, we're playing at the Pelican on September twentieth. So uh, just look up Executive Order Band on Facebook and uh, and follow us and come and check us out. We play some some great classic rock, anything from the from the seventies, even a couple of sixties, all the way up to you know some modern stuff. Like we're, we're doing, uh, like we just learned a Pink song recently. All right, cool. And you know there's various places um uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you if somebody wants to talk to coach tony other than the podcasts well you can send me an email coach tony w because that way they don't have to spell wexler <laughs> coach tony w at outlook.com or just look up my website tony w coaching.com and uh don't forget to check out the podcast, Strive to Thrive, the Purposely Positive podcast, where you will get positive content, and you'll get to hear Paul and I jamming together at the beginning and at the end. Yeah, well, it's been a lot of fun talking with you, reminiscing a little bit and talking about what you do in these days. So I want to thank you for your time in uh, talking with me on Hot Chocolate with Paul. Thanks, Paul. This has been a lot of fun.